بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلله فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله تعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إلا تنصروه فقد نصره الله إذ أخرجه الذين كفروا ثاني اثنين إذ هما في الغار إذ يقول لصاحبه لا تحزن إن الله معنا فأنزل الله سكينته عليه وأيده بجنود لم تروها وجعل كلمة الذين كفروا السفلى وكلمة الله هي العليا والله عزيز حكيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نواه فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هاجر إليه رواه البخاري ومسلم صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a favor from him that this event Rather, this series that we see, the Sira series organized by the, by the Compass Learning Center, that these have taken place, especially at this time of the year, where many different groups and many different people wish to show their love for the Prophet wasallam through different practices, through different acts, through certain types of worship, certain adhkar, etc. This time of year with many people <coughs> who don't really think about the Prophet wasallam start to see certain programs and hear certain speeches regarding the life of the Prophet wasallam. And many of these talks, unfortunately the speakers base their talks on things which are anything but from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And it's highly important that we as individuals strive to educate the Muslims and strive to educate the youth about the seerah and the life of the Prophet wasallam from the authentic sources. Today's talk, inshaAllah, I will tell you, will be based mainly upon two, two ahadith. One ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, one hadith in the Musad of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. More or less everything in the talk will be centered and the, um, the evidence will be these, these two hadith and the verse from the Quran which I researched in the khutbah. And the reason why it is very important to take the authentic and the correct lessons and the correct information in regards to the seerah of the Prophet wasallam is because as Muslims, <coughs> our duty and the command to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to take the example of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to bring that into practice into our own lives. Allah subhanahu wa taala says in the Quran, "لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا." That definitely, la qad, definitely for you, O believers, there is the perfect example in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The perfect example for the father, the perfect example for the husband, 
the perfect example for the teacher, the perfect example for a leader, the perfect example for an imam. And in this life of the Prophet wasallam, any person who looks at his life السلام, will find some kind of benefit and some lesson that he can apply to himself no matter who this person is and what his standing in society is or his professional life is like how religious he is no matter, no matter what he is doing he will find an example in the life of the Prophet وسلم, which he can apply to himself that is why it is very important for us to study the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, and to implement the lessons from the seerah and from his, from his life into our own lives and only this way will we find success in this world and in the hereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Say, O believers, إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ If you claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's leave alone the claim to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and focus on the claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Then follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. By following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then a person can say that he really loves Allah subhanahu wa taala. And likewise, by following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a person will be true in his claim that he loves the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As the poet famously says, the Arabic poet he says, translation inshallah, he says that you claimed with your mouth you claim to love Allah. You claim to love Allah. However, your actions. Your actions that you do, your actions speak anything but that. Meaning that you say you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but every single one of your actions goes against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You claim to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but every action in your life from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep, every single action goes against the sunnah and the orders of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and is in the displeasure of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says... This is this is this is weird. This is ridiculous. This is surprising. This is silly and it is stupid that a person says he loves the Prophet وسلم, but he does not even act upon one son of the Prophet. And we can see the very a tangible example, an easy example for those youngsters who love certain footballers, who love certain pop stars, certain musicians. Then you see them you see the youngsters copying their hairstyles, copying their way of dress copying the way they speak, listen to their music and liking their liking their photos and liking their pages on Facebook, following them on Twitter and Instagram etc. So this is their show this is the way they show their love for this pop star and for this for this actor or for this celebrity whoever he may be. In the exact same way if we want to show if we want to be true to our claim of loving the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then this needs to be manifested in our in our actions because if it doesn't then we are like that person who goes to the court. He goes to the he goes to the court and he says to the judge that I am making a claim that this person has stolen something from me. This person has stolen something from me. But he does not bring any evidence forward. He does not bring any proof, any witnesses, nothing he can bring forward to the judge. Will the judge accept his case? Of course not. Unless he's an incompetent judge from certain countries that we can see around the world. So what I'm saying is without witness and without evidence, this case will not be accepted. It will be thrown out. In the exact same way, if we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the day of judgment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that, what, have you, what have you done in the world? And we say, well, we didn't do much, but we loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we, we, we loved him more than we loved ourselves, etc., etc. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, okay, then if you loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give some proof of this. What did you do in your life that showed you loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So we look at us, how we prayed our salah, Never. Do you pray the Quran? No. Did we act upon the rulings? Did we act upon the commands given by, by the Prophet wasallam? No. The advice given by the Prophet wasallam. this is how you treat your neighbours, this is how you treat your friends, this is how you treat your family, this is how you treat your wife, this is how you treat your children. Did we act upon this advice? No. So then, in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how will we be able to back up this claim? And if we, do not be, if we are not able to back up this claim, then we will be in a very, very bad situation. So what I'm trying to say, coming back to the point, is if we, we see many people claiming to love the Prophet but 
There is no action upon the life of the Prophet ﷺ. There is no adoption of his teachings. A person is not taking the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, but he claims to love the Prophet ﷺ. So, in this, this series organized by the Compass Learning Center, broken down to three parts on the fourth final bayan, insha'Allah. The first talk is about the life of the Prophet ﷺ and the lessons that can be learned from his life prior to yani, in the Meccan period, while he was in Mecca, and he obviously he, he received the prophethood and he remained in Makkah al Mukarramah. The second part will be this what I will talk about inshallah the lessons from the Hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ and the migration to Medina to Munawwara and what lessons can be learned from this and how a person can apply these lessons to his life. And the third part inshallah will be about the life and the lessons from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his time in Medina to Munawwara and that will be delivered in Wernath Jamia Masjid. Talking about the Hijrah, why did the Muslims have to migrate? The Hijrah, Hijrah means to migrate, okay, migration. And Hijrah in Arabic means to leave something, to move away from something. And, and this can be seen in another hadith, Sahih hadith, again where the Prophet ﷺ says, that in the hadith is in Abu Dawood, if I'm not mistaken. لا يحل لمسلم أن يهجر أخاه فوق ثلاث فمن هجر فوق ثلاث فما تدخل النار The Prophet ﷺ says, it is not permissible for a Muslim to stop talking to his Muslim brother, to break relations with his Muslim brother, to move away, to go away from, from his Muslim brother, to break ties with him for more than three days. If he does this for more than three days and he dies in this state, then he will enter into the fire of hell. And again, this hadith could be used and a whole new talk could be given just on this one hadith and about the state of brotherhood in the Muslim ummah today. But the main thing is the word used, yahjura from hajar. To leave something. And that's what hijrah means, to leave something. And Shaykh Uthaymin rahimullah mentions about the different types of hijrah which can be seen in the in the books of the scholars. And we'll just mention inshallah two 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 the two most famous um hijras that you can say, I mean, the two most famous meanings and the way where hijrah could happen, okay? The first is hijrah from sins, to leave the sins, okay, to leave a sin is also considered hijrah as the hadith mentions al muhajiru man hajara khataya wa dhunub a muhajir a person who migrates and who migrates from sins and from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so hijrah um, hajar means to leave something and secondly hijrah means to the the other meaning which is the most famous meaning anyway is to leave a person a person to leave his hometown to leave his locality and move to another place why because he cannot practice upon his deen in the current place that he is in now obviously some people are of the view that hijrah can only take place, a person can only migrate to a Muslim country. But this is a, and you could say a fanciful view. And some, this, is, yani, this is what would be um, ideal, that a person migrates to a Muslim country. But ho however, the current state of the Ummah is that some people find it easier to practice Islam in a non-Muslim country than a Muslim country. And I will give you an example. In 2007, I went for Taraweeh to Italy, to Milan. And we went to a masjid there, the masjid were mostly Arabs, there, were not, um, there weren't any Pakistanis in the masjid, one Jamaat came, but other than that, they were all Arabs, Tunisians and Libyans, Algerians and Moroccans, etc. I met a Libyan brother there, he was about 40 years old, and we were just talking one day and I said to him, why did you leave Libya? This was when we went in 2007, Italy, still first generation Muslims, Muslims started moving there in the 1990s, that's what they told us. And he said, I moved from Libya, um, to, uh, I moved from, sorry, not sorry, from Libya, from Tunisia. He was a Tunisian brother. I moved from Tunisia to Italy. I did Hijrah. So I said to him, what do you mean you did Hijrah? He said, I find I found it easier. I came to Italy for a, on a business trip or for some, for some trip. And I found it easier to practice Islam in Italy than I did to practice it in Tunisia. And this person was talking 2007. Prior to that was when... when that um, enemy of Allah, Zain Abidin bin Ali, was in charge of Libya and uh, in Tunisia. And we know that people were arrested for keeping beards and praying salah meant that a person was a terrorist, etc. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved us from falling to such a fitna. So he migrated from an um, apparently Muslim country to a non Muslim country and he found it easier to practice Islam over there. And many of us sitting over here in England as well know it's a lot easier to practice Islam here in England than it would be in a lot of Muslim countries today. And this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep this blessing upon us. So the hijrah is when a person moves, and I was saying that some scholars 
are of the view that the migration only can happen to a Muslim country, but this, yani, I said that, that would be ideal, but in the current situation in the world today, sometimes a person will have to migrate to a non-Muslim country to yani, practice Islam more freely. So this hijrah again, that what the Muslims also did from Makkah to Al-Mukarramah, was again so that they could practice their religion freely. And you see, if you look into the life of the Prophet wasallam after he deceived yani, the Prophethood, initially, when he started giving the da'wah and calling people towards Islam, then a few people accepted Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, Ali radiallahu an, Sumayya, etc. Some of the, yani the weak Muslims, Bilal radiallahu an, they accepted Islam. So the Quraysh weren't too bothered about this. They thought to themselves, these are just some weak people, the people who have no, yani they have no status in society, and they have just joined this group to feel, you know, part of something, a group, and they can feel good about themselves. And this will be something for them to look forward to after their long shifts at work. They could go and sit with some of their friends and talk about these tales, which sound like tales of magic and, yani, of myths and legends. Okay, so they weren't too fussed about it at the beginning, the Quraysh. And they let the Muslims do whatever they wanted to do. However, as the Quraysh saw that this, this religion was spreading like a wildfire through Makkah al Mukarramah, then they started imposing yani, certain restrictions on the Muslims. And they started, yani, first they just said to them, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Then they started slowly, slowly. It came to an extent where the Muslims were being persecuted, Muslims were being tortured, and subhanAllah, some Muslims were being martyred for believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muslims migrated to Abyssinia. So Muslims migrated to Abyssinia, and Subhanallah, the the ruler there was a Christian, Najash. He was a Christian, and he allowed the Muslims. He was a Christian. He allowed the Muslims to enter to enter into Abyssinia and practice their religion freely over there in his land. And again, according to many narrations, he became a Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ also performed janaza, salatul janaza for him, yani aghaibana janaza, where the Prophet led the salah in Madinah to Munawwara for for the king. So this was the first migration. The, actual, the, the yani another migration which took place and which is a famous one is the one to Madinah to Munawwara. Before this, there were a few people going here and there to different places. But the major, two major ones you can say were to Abyssinia and to Madinah to Munawwara. Again, coming back to the Hijran about how the Kuffar first thought that they would, um, yani, they would, they would let things happen. You know, at the beginning when they let the Muslims do the Dawa, and they would see if it is getting to a level where. It will basically be a threat to them, then they would step in. So same thing happened with the Hijrah as well. The Muslims started migrating to Madinah to Munawwara, slowly, slowly, in yani, small numbers. They were going one or two people here and there, some people slipping out at night time, some people slipping out you know, during the Zahira, during the midday time when people were asleep. And yani, people were going slowly, so the Muslims were going away. And they were going yani, in secret so that the Quraysh do not try stopping them. Most of the Muslims migrated like this. And again, the Quraysh knew that the Muslims were migrating, but again, they felt... I only let them go, what are they going to do? They're going to go to Madinah to Munawwara, what will they do over there? However, the Quraysh, well, obviously, when they were seeing this and they could see that most Muslims had gone, then they made you know, they made this decision within themselves that we cannot allow the Prophet وسلم, to also migrate. Just a point on the people making a secret hijrah. As we said, most of the people did a secret hijrah. They went away in the middle of the night and you know, they were scared of the Quraysh attacking them. However, there was one person, when he was about to migrate, when he made the intention to migrate, before he migrated, he went... He went to the Kaaba, he went to the Haram, and he prayed Salah over there. And then all the chiefs of the Quraysh was, were, were sitting there. And he went over there to them, and this was Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And he said, he made an announcement, he made an announcement, he said, everybody listen to this announcement. I will be performing the Hijrah soon. I will be performing the Hijrah soon. Now, whoever wants to leave his wife a widow, or leave his children as orphans, then come and meet me over here. And we shall fi- we'll, we'll fight this out before I go for, before I perform my hijrah. And he made an, he made this announcement. Nobody obviously came to fight with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu because he was Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. As the hadith mentions that even Shaytan, the Prophet said to Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that oh Umar, I swear by Allah that when you walk on one street of Madinah Munawwara, or according to the, some translations, on one side of the street in Madinah Munawwara, then Shaytan runs away to the other side. Of Madinah to Munawwara and or to the other side of the street. This was the, yani, this was Umar radiallahu ta'ala, this was the shan and the face of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he performed his hijrah and most of the people had migrated. Now it was, yani, the Prophet was left, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was left, and a few yani, women were left behind. And the Quraysh knew that the time was close for the Prophet to also migrate. So we will, we will talk about why Madinah to Munawwara and I will take the events back to something which happened before the Hijrah which that will be later on. Let's just talk about the Hijrah of the Prophet 
The next part of the lecture, inshallah, inshallah, will be based mainly on hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she says, she says that since the day I was born, and as far as back as I can remember, my parents have always been Muslim. And her father and her mother, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha, and her mother had, all, had always been Muslim. And she says, and as far back as I can remember, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would come to visit us in our house every single day. He would come to visit us in our house every single day. And she says that one day, at the time of Qailula in, in the Shiddatul Har, the time of Zahira, which is midday, which is very hot in Arabia, and that is a time when everybody is sleeping, and just as you can see in Spain where they have the siesta, and in the Middle Eastern countries in Pakistan, etc., certain places, at this time, people are asleep, it's too hot to do anything, and people just want to have a rest. So she says that one day, at this time, where everybody's normally resting, we saw a figure approaching our house. And she says this figure had his head wrapped up, but you could see, and you could see a bit of the a bit of the person, and from far we could tell, and we recognized that this was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then this is obviously believable. And I'll give you a per personal example, Subhanallah. Um, I work at a school. Now when the children, when their parents come to pick them up, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, most of the parents, um, you know, they wear the niqab and they wear the burqa, etc. The children recognize their mothers from you know, from a long distance, out of 10, 15, all the way in the burqa and the niqab. They recognize their own mother straight away. And this is just one of those things where people know one another, they can recognize them even if they are covered up. So same way here, she says we recognize that it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she says that we knew he would only be coming because something very important must be going on, something major is about to happen, he's come for some news. And she knows and she says that we also knew that he would only be coming if it was something to do with the hijrah. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ had actually been waiting for permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, um, yani, to do the hijrah. He would be waiting for permission. And this obviously shows us that the Prophet ﷺ was not mukhtari kul. He did not have full, yani, yani, full um, subhanahu wa can we say, that choice on what to do. And he couldn't just decide that tomorrow I will migrate and that's it, I will go, I will migrate when I want. Or from tomorrow I will stop praying the Salah, I won't leave the Salah anymore. Or from the next day we won't perform the Jihad. This shows that the Prophet ﷺ was not Muhtari Kul and he did not have this full authority in doing these things. He had to wait from permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this again refutes the claims of certain people who say that the Prophet ﷺ is Muhtari Kul. He can do whatever he wants. He can be in 20 places at once or a million places at once, etc. Et this, this just this hadith and one, one line from this hadith proves this. And common sense and all so many other verses and so many incidents in the life of the Prophet ﷺ also prove this. So she says, and yani he was he had been waiting for permission. <coughs> so when he came to the Prophet, so when he came to the Prophet and came to the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, he knocked on the door, and the door was opened by Abu Bakr Siddiq. Again, this hadith Subhanallah shows us that even if a person is going to his best friend's house, Abu Bakr Siddiq was the closest person to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Likewise, he'll be with him in Jannah, and he was his he was his he was his closest companion, as the as the hadith all affirm to this. Even then. The Prophet وسلم, knocked on the door before entering. He did not just open the door, and even though there was something so important, major about to happen, he still kept these um, adab and these etiquettes in mind. And this is something we need to also basically we need to implement this. Okay, if you are going even to our own cousin's house, even if you know, within the house, I'm going to my brother's bedroom. I should knock on the door first. Should I just a person should I just barge in? He could be and he get, he might be undressed or getting changed or he might be doing something private. He might be and he's stashing money under the mattress that he doesn't want me to see. <laughs> Subhanallah. So a person should have just you know, going like this, should knock on the door. The Prophet knocked on the door and so Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhiwan opened the door and the Prophet said to him, and you know, he can we come in? He came inside. Then he said to Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhi Ran that um, move everyone out from within the house. Move the people out from within the house because I need to tell you something obviously private, which is about the hijrah. But and Abu Siddiq said to the Prophet that only your family over here, yani just your family, Aisha Rudlanha, just your family over here, and there's nobody else. And obviously she was a family because her nikah had already taken had already taken place with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. the nikah had happened, the consummation hadn't, but the yani the I do's and the yani the nikah had taken place. So she says, I was I was there, and the rooms, yani, in those days, the room was split into compartments with, yani, a, a partition, not one of these partitions, but like a, 
um, subhanAllah, a veil or some cloth hanging in between and this was a little partition. So she said I could hear everything from, from within this little place that I was in my compartment. The Prophet said, said to Abu Bakr Siddiq that I have been given permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to migrate. At this point Abu Bakr Siddiq said, radiallahu anhu arda, he said, As-suhbatu ya Rasulullah, As-suhbatu ya Rasulullah, O Rasulullah ya, ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have I been given permission to be your companion? As sahbah to be for companionship meaning have I been given permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take yani to go with you on this epic journey, on the most important journey in the history of Islam, the most important journey in the history of this world because it could change the course of world history. Yani am I allowed to go with you? And the Prophet said, Yes, you have been given permission to accompany accompany me on this yani on this journey. So Abu Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala said to the Prophet that I have been preparing two camels for us. Since three months or four months I have been preparing these two camels for us. And the Prophet said to him, yeah, Abu Siddiq, that I will pay you for this camel. And he said, no, 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 this is for you, I, I got this for you. The Prophet said, no, no, I will pay you for this camel. And he gave the money to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala. Two lessons from this. The first is the action of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, that he had prepared the camels three months before. He had prepared the camels three months before. So, even though he was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he was, yani, subhanAllah, the hadith mentions that if the iman of the whole, every single Muslim was put on one side of the scales, and the iman of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, was put on one side, his iman would be stronger than all of our iman combined. But even then, he did, he did ikhtiyar al-asbab. He took, yani, he took provisions, he took measures, he took steps to make sure that they were ready for this journey. This proves to us that if a person was to do ikhtiyar al-asbab, was to take some measures, preventive measures, or was to take, was to do something like this, it does not mean that he has gone against the tawakkul and against the reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, we see many Muslims who fall into this, yani, into this folly, into this misunderstanding. And they think that tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that a person, yani, he, doesn't, he doesn't do anything, and he does tawakkul and this will be enough for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide for him. So a person says, he stands in the middle of the M62, and there's a lorry coming, and he stands there, and he says, I have to walk upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save me. And then the lorry comes and hits him, and this person is turned into minced meat. Who is to blame? Who can he blame? Well, he's dead anyway. But he can only blame himself, subhanAllah. Because the tawakkul means that a person also needs to take these asbab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him these. So a person wants to... He wants to buy a house, he wants to donate some money to the to the masjid, he wants to donate some money to charity, then he has to ikhtiyar al-asbab, he needs to earn some money first. He needs to go and he needs to get an education, he needs to get a job, he needs to save some money and then he can spend it in this way and then he can yani, he can have tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once he earns this money and he, he can spend it and he has tawakkul that Allah will give him the ability to spend the money and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept his wealth in his yani, in this charity. So this this part of the yani this part of the story shows that it is not against tawakkul to do this. Second part, which where the Prophet ﷺ said, "No, I will pay you for this camel," shows that the Prophet ﷺ never liked handouts. Yani, okay, okay, this was obviously this is a crude way of saying it, but he never liked to take anything for free, and whenever he could give some money for something, then he would do that. Obviously, we know later on in life when he was in Madinah to Munawwara, there were times where the 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 stove you know where they cooked the food was not the fire was not lit for three or four months because there was nothing to eat. And they just lived on dates and water. But whenever he had the, whenever he was in the position to, subhanAllah, and he give money and pay for himself or do anything where he could provide for himself, he would do this. So a lesson for us again, that whenever, and he, this, is, this is again some habit, some, some social etiquette, subhanAllah. They have a group of friends go out to eat. Now if there are five, four or five is eating and the meal, and he, we've all eaten the food and everyone's partaking the food and it comes to 50 pounds and there are five of us and every person knows that in his pocket he has five or ten pounds in his pocket then he should not sit there like a lemon and you know I don't have any money and let someone else someone else pay and this is lying firstly and secondly it's just you know, this is stinginess this is this is this is not a quality of a Muslim this is not something and this is a you know, it's a dirty habit and it's not a good quality to have so this part of the hadith and this part of the story tells us this that we should yani, we should be we should be doing these kind of things and we should be acting upon the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now they had been given this permission, they had been given this permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were about to set, out, set off on this journey. And I'll just mention one more incident, inshallah, then I will take you back to the night before, which and which will obviously which is also a very important part of this lecture and part of the story. The food had been prepared by Asma, who was the half-sister, step-sister of Aisha, 
Asma's mother was a mushrika and Abu Bakr Siddiq had divorced her and got married to an Aisha's mother who was, who was a Muslim. Asma bint Abu Bakr anha was there and she had prepared some food for the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu arda for their journey. And in the heat of the moment she had nothing to tie the food with. She had the food but there was nothing in her bag to put it in. So she took off her belt, scarf, belt thing and she took this and she ripped it in half and she tied the food in one part of this and the rest she she, you know, she used for herself and that is why she was called Dhun um, Taqin she was called as the woman the she of the two scarves okay this is why she was called this and the food was put like this and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr Siddiq Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu yani they, 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 they were ready to go on, their, on, on this journey <coughs> going back to the night before and what I was, I was mentioning about um, SubhanAllah what I was mentioning about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sorry about the Mushrikeen allowing the Muslims to go and just waiting for the time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would go and this is when they would make their move so this again this this, this hadith is mentioned in the Muslim the Imam Ahmad um, two narrations again both from here with a bit of addition from Ibn Abbas and um, and, and, and the Tabi'i okay Qatada Rahimahullah the night before the, the night before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated the Mushrikeen had got gotten together, they had gathered together in a place called Darul Nadwa. Darul Nadwa was a place where the Mushrikeen got together when they wanted to make their big decision. It was like their it was like their White House, okay? It was like the House of Parliament. And this is where they would get together and they would make their big decisions. And they had got together and they were they had gathered together for this one for this discussion. And the discussion was that we know that most of the Muslims have migrated and it's very soon where the Prophet will also migrate. What can we do about this? This is what they had gathered together. To talk about so on, and there's another little point mentioned again, which which is from another narration, and the person mentions that while these people are they had gathered together to have this discussion, there was a knock on the door, and when there was a knock on the door, the door was opened, and there was an old man standing there, and he said that I am a I am a chief for one of the tribes of the Najd, from one of the side of Arabia, and I've come and I've heard about this meeting, and I've I've come to give you some counsel and give you some of my advice. I am an old man, you can listen to my advice, take it or leave it, and I'll just sit here in your meeting. So they allowed him in. And the narrator mentions that this old man actually was Shaytan, who had come in this, in this, under this disguise and, uh, and looking like an old man, to make sure that these people went ahead with their, with their plot and their plan, what they were, meant, what they wanted to do. So they sat down. Now Abu Jahl was over there, and, and a few people over there, and they got together and they were talking. <coughs> Some people came out with different plans. Okay, so the first plan was, why don't we just, why don't we just let him go? Let's, let's just, let's just banish him from Maktul Mukarramah and kick him out and let him go. So the opposition was that obviously that's what that's what they want that if we let them go to this place and that is what we are actually trying to stop if they go over there they become stronger the Muslims become stronger they have a base they could even politically challenge us militarily challenge us we cannot allow this to happen so this idea was shot to the ground the next idea was why don't we imprison him why do we imprison this Prophet وسلم, and yani, this way we, he he can't. He can't preach to his followers and his message and this movement of his will be confined to a house where he's in under house arrest. So again this this idea was also put down and they said what if some of the people who are guarding him start to listen to his magic because obviously they said it was magic. They said what if you, they come under the influence of this magic and they also start believing in him. What should we do then? So this idea was also put down. Then Abu Jahl was sitting there. Abu Jahl, the Mala'un, he was sitting there and he said, he cleared his throat and he said, there's something on every single person's mind. Every single person here is thinking one thing. But none of you have the guts to say it. None of you are man enough to say that thing that is on everyone's mind. But it's on my mind also and I have the guts to say it. And I will say this thing. And my suggestion is, why don't we kill him? Why don't we kill the Prophet wasallam? This was the suggestion of Abu Jahl. And he said, this is what everybody is thinking. But none of you want to say this. And they all agreed. But then there was the... I mean, there was there was opposition but what if one of us kill him then his tribe will attack us and there will be a big war so then they were given the counsel and they were and they agreed that one youngster one strong man one warrior from every tribe would get his weapon and they would go to the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they would subhanallah they would go to the house of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they would attack him at once and all of them would march him at once and that way the blame would be distributed to all the different tribes. So who who will fight with you know, 10, 15 tribes against one tribe? There would be no fight. And they said that the, the Prophet's tribe and Nuhashim would have to accept our blood money and the you know, Mu'amala, everything would be finished. So they agreed upon this and they got ready. So they went that very night. They went and 
They went to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu and they surrounded his house and they, wait, they were lying there in wait, okay? So if you look again, subhanAllah, at the story, this shows the plan of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the verse where Allah Subhanahu Wa very clearly says, wa makaru wa makaru Allah, wa Allah khiru makreen. They plot and they plan and Allah also plans and Allah Allah also has a plan that he wants to put in place. Wa Allah khiru makreen. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the best of planners. Why? Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is alim al ghayb. He knows what happens in the future. He knows what has happened in the past. He knows what people are thinking. So if he makes a plan, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then he can make the plan Azza wa Jal, according to how everything would work in favor of the Muslims. And this is what happened. So these people made their plan and the Prophet ﷺ had also obviously received the order from the Prophet, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were going to migrate. These people surrounded the house of the Prophet ﷺ and it's very famous when they surrounded the house and um, Ali radiallahu was lying in the bed and instead of the Prophet ﷺ, and they went there and the Prophet ﷺ walked past them and he recited their verses and he threw sand onto their heads and dust as a mark of humiliation and he went and, and the migration took place. And subhanAllah, that is, I mean, that is the end of that part of the of the hijrah. The initial, first, the first phase. The next part again will be the next three days of the Prophet Sallallahu Hijrah, okay? When the Prophet Sallallahu went out from Madinah for Makhtar Muqarramah with Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, now if we look, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu, radiallahu anhu had made, um, had made a pact and made an agreement with three people. He had made an agreement with three people. The first was his son, um, SubhanAllah, Abdullah bin Abu Bakr I think was his name and he made an agreement with him and the agreement with him was that he would yani, he would go through, go to the markets, to the bazaar etc he would go to these places and because he was a young boy he would just walk around and listen to what people are saying listen to what people are saying what, what what's the word on the streets and he can come at night time and he can come later on and tell his um, father and the Prophet what, what the plans were of the mushrikeen to deal, this was the first agreement with his son Abu Bakr, uh, with his son Abu Bakr had made radiallahu anhu. The second deal he had made with, was with his um, slave whom he had, sl- uh, yani his freed slave, okay? Azad Qadda Ghulam was in Urdu, his freed slave. And the deal with him was that every day after my son comes to the cave and he gives us the food and he tells us all the, st- uh, all the yani, akhbar, then you come, and yani he told the free slave, you come with all the with all the sheep and the goats because he was a shepherd, he used to be a shepherd for the people of Mecca. You come and you make sure you graze over the footprints of my son so that the people do not know where we are hiding. And the third deal he'd made was with the, was with a person called Abdullah bin Arqat <coughs> who was to be their guide and he was not a Muslim. I'll come back to this one inshallah. So the Prophet ﷺ and Abu uh, Siddiq came out from Muqtul Muqarramah and instead of going towards Madinah Munawwara, they turned back on themselves and they went in the opposite direction to a place called Thor, a cave, Ghari Thor, and they went into into this cave and they stayed in this cave for three days. Now when the Mushrikeen in the morning when they went to kill the Prophet and they saw there was Ali Radulan, they realized they had been tricked. So they sent out the party, sent out the people to track down the Prophet and Abu Bakr Siddiq Radulan and they obviously went straight out towards Madhita Munawara. Obviously after going for a few hours with their horses and the rest of it, they realized that the Prophet and Abu Bakr Siddiq cannot have gone further than this, which means they are somewhere else. They have gone either that way, another way, or they have basically they are hiding around here somewhere. So they came back, and again within the first day they could not find anyone. So what happened? The second day they sent out this a memo, not a memo obviously, but they put out this announcement, and they said, whoever helps us, whoever finds these two people, Abu Bakr Siddiq and the Prophet whoever finds these two people and brings them to us, dead or alive, will get a hundred camels as a reward. 100 camels is a big thing. Imagine someone said to you, if you find this person, you'll get 100 cars. Even if it's 100 micros, it's still 100 cars, okay? So you'll get 100 camels as a reward. So again, people were in this in this lalaj, in this hirs, and this lust for the wealth, and they were yeah, looking for the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, arda. The Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, were in this cave. Now, the first after the first day with the mushrikeen searching for them, they had given up and they had they they hired an expert, a scout, a pathfinder, a person who could look for the Prophet ﷺ and look for Abu Siddiq and help them find these two um, these two people. So this person he came and he traced he traced the uh, the trail all the way to Ghari-Thor. Ghari-Thor is in the mountain, so to the bottom of the base of the mountain, and he traced the base of the mountain and he said that this is where the trail is. I can bring you to here, but after this, I don't know where these people have gone, but it's somewhere around here. So and he and he went and the mushrikeen, all the big the big mushriks, the big chiefs of the tribes, Utbah, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Abu Jahal, Abu Sufyan, they had all come 
and they were then they were ready to catch the Prophet and Abu Bakr Siddiq and they came close and they came so close to the cave that the Abu Bakr Siddiq said to the Prophet that if any of these were to look down if any of these were to look down now just look at their feet if um, then they will see us if they would just look down because it was not it's not it wasn't actual cave it was like a crevice like a little hole in the ground to the side and it was and he was in a proper cave and wasn't very very wide or spacious it was just enough for two people to fit inside and he said if any of these look down they will see us and as I said to him, said, very famous words very famous words beautiful words he said ma dhannuka ma dhannuka bithnayni allahu thalithuhuma ma dhannuka bithnayni allahu thalithuhuma what do you think of those two people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the third of them that we are two, and Abu Bakr Siddiq and the Prophet are two, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the third with us. He is helping us and He will protect us. He will safeguard us from these people and their evil plots. And this is what happened. The people went away and they did not find the Prophet them. And there are some narrations that can be found, and which are, subhanAllah, not very ranging from, not very authentic to completely mawdu <laughs> about birds uh, laying, uh, building a nest and laying, uh, laying eggs and a spider covering the, the cave. Etc. But the main thing is that these people did not find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Siddiq. After the third day, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Siddiq set off to Madin to Munawwara. They did not set off straight in the direction of Madin to Munawwara. They actually went in the opposite direction down towards Jeddah. And then they turned up yani around the side and they went towards Madin to Munawwara. And subhanAllah, look at the beauty. And look at this. Yani, subhanAllah, this is just the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But recently, after yani, maybe 10-20 years ago in, in Saudi Arabia when they were building the new highway to connect Makhtul Makarama to Madin to Munawwara then the engineers looked at all the possible options as the engineers do and they looked at all the possible routes that they could, yani, they could map out and they could do and they saw subhanAllah that the route taken by the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr Siddiq in the Hijrah radiallahu anhu arda is actually the best route to Madin to Munawwara subhanAllah and this motorway today in Saudi Arabia, what is it called? This motorway, Tariq al Hijra. It is called Tariq al Hijra, the roots of the Hijra. And this again is a favor and blessing of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and all praises for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Prophet Sallam and them Abu Siddiq set off. Now they guide Abdullah bin Arqat, as I mentioned. Abdullah bin Arqat was not a Muslim. Abdullah bin Arqat was not a Muslim. So look at the implications of this. Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiyallahu anhu arda hired a non-Muslim, trusted, more or less, trusted his life and the life of the Prophet ﷺ with a non-Muslim. What does this lesson show us? What, what lesson do we learn from this? The lesson we learn is that it's completely permissible. It is 100% halal for, for you, for a Muslim, to hire a non-Muslim, to have a non-Muslim employee, to get a job done by a non-Muslim, if he feels that this non-Muslim is going to do a better job for him. Ideally, we'd want the job to be done by a Muslim, by one of our Muslim brothers and sisters, so and it could be increased in their sustenance and we could increase in their, in their profit and in their business. But if we know, and the unfortunate reality is that normally a non-Muslim is going to do a better job for us, and not putting down any Muslim um, builders or plumbers or engineers, etc. But normally, unfortunately, the case is that a non-Muslim will do a better job for us. So this hadith shows that if you only go to the person who is going to do a better job for you, because a, a, a Muslim is not a person who, and he, as I say in Bush, to a malang, malang, he's not a malang that, and he, he's used to, oh, you know what, I'm going to be so simple in life that I'm going to get my car fixed by a person who doesn't know how to fix the car. And even though he doesn't know how to fix the car, but I'll get fixed by him because I don't want a perfect car. I don't want my car to work properly because, you know, I'm so simple. This is not the way of Islam, okay? <clears throat> you get certain people who, subhanAllah, these, you know, these, uh, <laughs> Certain individuals who eat who eat bread with mold on yani bread, moldy bread, or they eat food which is yani which has been off for a year or something, and by eating this they show that they are very simple and this is their zuhd and this is their abstinence from the dunya. And this is not abstinence from dunya. This is a this is kufran This is this is not accepting the ni'mah and the blessing of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Okay, so a Muslim can yani he can get a job done by a non-Muslim if the non-Muslim is doing a proper job, as we can see from this from this hadith. They follow Abdullah bin Arqat, okay? So now another, now we will come where another person enters into the story. Another person enters into the story now. And this person is called Suraqa. Okay? Suraqa was a chief of one of the tribes who lived on the outskirts of Makhtul Mukarrama, one of the, yani, from the A'rab. 
And he had also heard, and everyone had heard about this, about these three riders who had gone, and that the Quraysh had put out a bounty of a hundred camels. And he says, and he's mentioned the hadith, he became a Muslim later on, alhamdulillah. And he narrates the hadith. And he says, that I was sitting around, and he goes, me and my tribe, and we were all sitting around a place we were eating. And all of a sudden, one of, and another one of our members from the tribe, he came running and he said that, I was just out hunting somewhere, and I saw these three riders, and they were going in a certain direction, and from... This I could tell that these are the three people that the Prophet that I mean, these are the three people that the Quraysh have been talking about, and these are the three people with the bounty on their heads. Suraka says, I said to him, no, 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 this because Suraka was greedy for these hundred camels, and he said to him, no, 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 I know who these people are. These are people from a certain tribe, and they told me they were going over there, and he don't worry about it. Suraka narrates the Hadith, radiyallahu anhu. He narrates that as soon as everybody had you know, gathered and you know, settled down again, and everyone was eating, etc. I slept out and I went home as fast as I could. As soon as I got home, I said to my wife, get my armor ready, get my you know, weapons. And he said, I put my armor on, I got my weapons. I started up my horse. I got to my horse and I, as quick as I flush, I went into that direction, into that direction. Because I knew it was those three people that the Quraysh were after. And he says, as I was going, I went at full speed, lightning speed on my horse. The horse was on a camel, as was Abu Bakr Siddiq. A horse is obviously a lot faster than a camel. So he says, I went as fast as I could. And he goes, from a distance, I saw those people. I saw the people. And he goes, I spurned my horse on to get closer to them. So he says, as soon as I got a bit closer, my horse threw me off. My horse stopped, threw me off and sat down on the floor. And he says that my horse had never ever done this to me. And people who have kept horses, people who have kept horses, um, and you keep a horse for a long time, the horse knows the person. And you just see people of the dog, etc. The dog listens to the owner. The horse is the exact same way. The horse is like a person's companion who keeps his horse. And he says, he had never done this before. I'd been in many battles with it and I'd been on many hunting trips. And I'd never done this before. This was the first time. And he goes, from this, I could, and he was a sign for me. But he says, I did not want to stop this. He goes, but just to and he, uh, take away the doubts for myself, I took out my Aslam. Aslam is like these kind of little arrows that they would have in the Quraysh and the, the, the pagans actually at the time. And on each arrow would be something like, yes, no. Basically, do this, don't do this, do something else, or stop, or whatever. They had all these little things on the Aslam. And what they would do is they would throw the Aslam down, and then somehow they would work out that this is the one that the arrows want him to follow. And they would look at the arrow, and they would see what he would say on the arrow. So he says, it's like, subhanAllah, it's like the istikhara for them, okay? It's like istikhara for them. So he, he threw him down, he says, I threw him down, and I looked. And the arrows were telling me, the Aslam were telling me, that don't go forward, stop, go back. But he says, the love for those hundred camels were in my heart. And I, I ignored this and I got back to my horse and I started following them again. He says, as we were following them, second time he goes, I got closer again. As soon as I got closer, my horse threw me off and sat down. And he says, again, I realized that I shouldn't be doing this spot. Because just to, and he goes, I took out my Aslam, threw him on the floor. And again, the Aslam said to him, don't go forward. Go back, don't go forward. And he says, again, he says, the love for the, um, for the hundred camels were in my heart. And I got back up to the horse and I followed these three men again. He says the third time I got even more closer and I got close enough that I could and he shout at them and I could actually see that the person there were two there were three riders so on and he mentions that there was one rider in front which was the guy Abdullah bin Arqat and he says there was one person um, riding on the yani on the camel just looking forward reciting something and he says subhanallah says the third rider kept going in front of the one of the riders and yani he goes a rider that was just looking forward he goes there was another rider the third rider who kept going in front then he would go behind then we go to the right, then we go to the left, and he was looked in a very agitated state. And this was Ashla Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And the reason he was doing this was because when he was when he used to ride behind the Prophet, he would think, What if the Prophet was attacked from the front? So you go in front of him. Then he would think to himself, What if he's attacked from the right? He would go to the right. Then he would be riding like this, then he would think, What if he's attacked from the left? And we go to the left. And this was again subhanAllah, putting his own life before the life of the Prophet. And again, this is what I believe in. this is our this is what our the requirement from us is. There's a time, if we were there at the time of the Prophet and the honor of the Prophet was being attacked, or the Prophet himself was being attacked, then as Muslims, and as the right of the Prophet over us is that we put our lives on the line for the Prophet So if a person was to throw an arrow at the Prophet then every single Muslim required to stand in front of that arrow. It's to stand in front of that arrow and stand in front of that spear, and take that spear on the chest, and not to allow even a stone, and not to allow even a thorn to prick the Prophet, the foot of the Prophet so Suraka, he says that this, you know, he, he, he saw this. And the third time when he got closer, he says, I fell down and the horse threw me off and then the horse would not even get back up. 
the horse stopped, it, it sat down and it would not get back up. And he says, then I realized that these people, their affair would spread, meaning that this Islam would definitely spread. And he goes, I knew that when this would happen, then they would come and they would conquer my tribe. And before that, I wanted a guarantee from the Prophet ﷺ that the Muslims would spare me. So he says, I called out to the Prophet ﷺ and I said to them that you don't have anything to fear of me. And I will, yani, I just want some agreement from you and I guarantee from you that nobody will attack me. And nobody will, yani, will, will take my life when the Muslims conquered the rest of Arabia. And the Prophet ﷺ got Abdullah bin Arqad to write down this, this thing for him. And he gave this on a, on a piece of leather or some parchment and gave it to Surafa. Subhanallah. Now when Sura, Surafa says the Prophet was about to go, and as he was on his camel, he turned around and he looked at me. Remember, Suraka was a Muslim at this time. He says the Prophet turned around and he looked at me and he said, Oh Suraka, Kaifa Bik, Suraka, how would you be the day when you wear the bracelets of Kisra? What will be your state the day you wear the bracelets of Kisra? Suraka says, I looked at the Prophet in amazement, in bewilderment, and I said, Kisra, the son of Hormuz. Yani Kisra, the emperor of the Persian Empire, there were two empires, the Persian one and the Roman one. The emperor of the Persian Empire, am I going to be wearing his bracelets? Suraka, from this little tribe in, Medi in Arabia, a country which not even the Romans on one side, the Romans had advanced all the way, they had increased the empire till they came to Arabia from this side. The Persians increased the empire all the way from there till they came to Arabia on this side. And nobody wanted to do the Arabs, that's how uncivilized and barbaric they were. And he said, Suraka is going to wear the braces of, of Kisra. And the Prophet did not reply and he, and he, he rode off. SubhanAllah, let's just, let's just finish off the story of Suraka and then we'll go, go over the final point, inshaAllah. Suraka, now Suraka um, became a Muslim later on when the, Muslims, when the army of the Prophet and the, the Sahaba conquered the areas around Maktoum and Karama and the tribes. Then Suraka came with his parchment and he showed this to the people. He said, Look, I have this guarantee from the Prophet that I will not be attacked. And he became Muslim and he fought in many battles. Now Suraka moved and he moved to Madinatul Munawwara and performed Hijr and he moved to he moved to Madinatul Munawwara. After the Prophet passed away, Abu Bakr Siddiq Radhiallahu became the Khalif. After he passed away, Umar Radhiallahu was the leader of the Muslims. He was Amir al-Mu'mineen, and it was in his reign where the Muslims conquered the Persian Empire and the Persian the Kisra's palace was ransacked and all the wealth and all the jewelry and everything from there was bought to Madinatul Munawwara. And it was put in the masjid, in the masjid of Nabawi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and overflowing with treasures and gold and silver and all of these precious stones. And this, this hadith I mentioned about Suraka and Prophet said to him that, how will you be when these bracelets of Kisra are on your arms? This was something that was, was famous. It was, a, it was this legend in Madinah Mura that the Prophet made a prophecy when he was migrating and he told Suraka that this is what was going to happen. And they say, the hadith mentions, the narration mentioned that Umar radiallahu he made an announcement. In, in the masjid, he said, Call Suraka, where is Suraka? Call Suraka. And Suraka was brought to, uh, to Masjid al Nabawi and he was sat, and they made him sit, Umar told him to sit on the chair of the Khalif, where he would actually sit, sit in that special chair. And he sat there, and then Umar with his own hands, he sifted through all that jewelry and he found the braces of Kisra. He found the braces of Kisra and he put them onto the hands of Suraka and all the Muslims started shouting out, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and the masjid was echoing with the with the takbirat and with the the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Suraka was put onto the shoulders of the people and the people are walking around Madinah Munawar with Suraka and Surah and yani this was this was the fulfillment of the prophecy made by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah look at the situation when he made the prophecy. Where was he? Running for his life and yani migrating and in fear of his life from Makhtum Karma to Madinah Munawar and he made this prophecy to Suraka was he even a Muslim? And then this prophecy was fulfilled many, many years later. Exact same way. If we make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today, if we make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's not accepted straight away, it's not accepted straight away, should, does not mean we give up hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, we have patience and we, we believe, we know that the hadith mentions if a person makes a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then either the dua is accepted. Or through this dua not being accepted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves this person from a calamity. Or this dua is kept as a dakhira, as a treasure for him in the hereafter. And in the hereafter he will come and he will see mountains and mountains of good deeds. And he will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, where did these come from? And they will be told that these are the duas that you made which were accepted. And then the hadith mentions that this person will wish that if only, if only 
the rest of my du'as were accepted if only all of them had been left unanswered and Allah has saved them all for me for the hereafter and I could use the good deeds today, okay? So a person should never give up in the hope in the in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never become despondent from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Coming back to the hijrah, so we've covered this part, okay? Now obviously the question arises, why did the Muslims migrate to Madin to Munawwara? They could have migrated to another place. Why was Madin to Munawwara chosen? The first thing is, the Muslims didn't just migrate to Madin to Munawwara. It wasn't one of those things where they just decided to go to Madin to Munawwara. Rather, this had been a process. I mean, for many years, this is a person I've been having dealings and negotiations with the people from Madin to Munawwara, which I'll mention soon, inshallah. And that is when the Muslims migrated. But the reason why Madin to Munawwara was chosen was because the Prophet ﷺ had looked at the at the um, landscape in Madin to Munawwara and saw. That in Madin to Munawwara, most of the people were Ahlul Kitab, yani they were Yahud, they were Jews. And the Jews were obviously at that time, the Prophet ﷺ, the ones in Madin Madi to Munawwara were, yani he saw that they were actually people of the book and they have a close connection with the Muslims because they do Musa and his salam. We are, let us just keep clear this up. We as Muslims are closer to the teachings of Musa and salam. We are close to Musa and salam. He is more beloved to us and we actually show him more respect than the Jews themselves show to Musa and salam. So now, these people, the Prophet have seen them and he had, he had decided that we would migrate there because we, would have, we won't have that much opposition from the Jews because they kind of, you know, we've got some kind of understanding, at least they believe in Allah, the Mushrikeen who just want to worship idols. So, this was why Madin to Munawar was chosen by the Prophet wasallam, and obviously we know looking at the rest of the history that it was actually, unfortunately, when they migrated, the biggest opposition to the Muslims came from the Yahud. These are the people who the Muslims feared from the most, the treachery and, and their back, backstabbing which was seen in the Battle of um, Al-Khandaq. Before the migration to Madrid to Munawar al-Prophet Sallam, we know that um, look, looking at brief history of Arabia, people would come to Makhtu al mukarramah for the Hajj. And they had their own form of the Hajj, but they would come for the Hajj and they would come from everywhere to Makhtu al mukarramah So when these people, obviously one year a few people came from Madrid to Munawar, which was actually called Yathrib at that time, okay? And they became Madin to Murab because of the blessing by, by the Prophet and moving to Madin to Murab, that's why it was changed to Madin to Munawwara or Madina or Madin to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first time a group of people came, about six people came from Madin to Munawwara. And the Prophet met them in the Hajj season and he spoke to them about Islam. About six people and they accepted this message and the Prophet told them that you go back to Madin to Munawwara and you spread this message to your people. And you tell them this you tell them this message and you tell them about Islam, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we will see it next year in the next Hajj season. And if you look at the narrations, six people went back to Madin to Munawara. The next year, seventy people came. This was called Bayatul Aqaba, okay? And this, the next year seventy people came from Madin to Munawara to um, uh, to um, for the Hajj and came to meet the Prophet. This again shows that a person the, the Muslims the reason why we are falling behind, the reason why we are in this state today is we have left this, um, we have left this ta'wa, which is uh, the Amr bin Ma'roof, Annahi al Munkar, enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. We have left this ta'wa, let alone to yani, non Muslims, we don't even give ta'wa to our own Muslim brothers. If we see a Muslim brother doing something wrong, nobody wants to do anything. And they want to yani, say, I will mind my own business and yani, I, will, I will stay away from this. This is why we have come to such a low state. And as soon as we start doing Amr bin Ma'roof, Annahi al Munkar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us back onto khayr, khayr ummah. We will be again the best of people. But we need to, we need to in, in, indulge in Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar as much as we can. Hadith mentions very clearly in Sahih Muslim. Whoever sees something wrong should stop it with his hands. If he's not able to stop it physically, then stop it with his tongue, verbally stop it. And if he cannot even do this, then he should at least think bad of it in his heart. So we need to turn back to this. The point being that these six people went and within a year they brought 70 people back with them to the, to the um, Bayatul Bay Aqaba and they spoke against the Prophet ﷺ. Now, subhanAllah, the second time when the pledged people pledged, and again there are some other lessons that can be found from this, I'll just mention inshallah too. The first one, Ibn Abbas, when actually Abbas was there, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and he was, he, was, he was actually being on guard. And the... Actually, I mentioned two or three things now. No, sorry. The Prophet ﷺ had this second aqaba on the last day of Hajj. On the last day of Hajj, he did this aqaba, and obviously, the lesson from this we can see is that the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, again, I was talking about tawakkul and ikhtiar al asbab. 
that this was the day where all the people had performed the hajj and everybody was asleep and after all the rituals etc whoever's been hajj knows how, how taxing it is and they're going to sleep and the Prophet had this meeting and this pledge with the people on this night because he knew that there would be less chance of people interrupting them and less chance of people trying to and mess this up or try to find out what the Muslims were doing and try to disrupt this that is what the Prophet had it on, this last, on the last day of hajj Another thing mentioned, again in the, in the riwayah, is mentioned that when Abbas Radiallahu saw these people who came, there were 70 people, they were mostly youngsters. They were mostly youngsters who came from Madhita Munawwara. And he was not very happy with this, that these youngsters weren't. And these are youngsters, they are just in Josh, as we say normally, unfortunately nowadays. We see a lot of the elders saying that, which again is, and it is fault from the elders and the youngsters, but a lot of the elders say, oh, these youngsters can't do anything. And they discourage the youngsters from doing so, they've organized a talk. What's going to happen? They're going to have 50 people come and they're going to eat the food and they don't act upon etc. So this was again, <laughs> subhanAllah, and um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proved through this that sometimes the youngsters can do something that the elders can't do and sometimes the elders can do things that the youngsters can't do and this is this is the part of life. Now when, this, when the when the Aqaba, when the, the second, in the second pledge, in the first pledge there was no um, mention of any military thing. There was no mention of fighting with the, with the mushrikeen. However, in the second Aqaba, the second pledge that happened here in Bay al-Aqaba, one of the conditions was that if the Mushrikeen attacked the Prophet ﷺ, remember this again because this is another point I'll mention inshallah, that if the, if the Prophet ﷺ is attacked, then the Medina Munawwara, people of Medina, will defend the Prophet ﷺ. So there was no deal of offensive jihad, there was just a deal for defensive jihad. And we'll, this is an important thing because we can mention this inshallah. Um, and this was the deal done. Now, after the deal was concluded, the bay'ah was done. Everyone gave their bay'ah. Subhanallah again. Just another, <laughs> another point, inshallah. There were also some women in this, in this, who came for the pledge. And the riwayah mentioned that the women did not touch hands with the Prophet ﷺ when they gave their bay'ah. So, a lesson we can learn nowadays: if a peer, any of these, any, if any person, any, any pious person. Well, outwardly pious, he won't be pious if he says this. But if an outwardly pious person says, when he gets some female murids and says, Yeah, hold my hand and we do bay'ah, or I do um, a massage of my feet, as do Aiba, um, bay'ah to the female um, murids, then they should say to him, No, this is against the son of the Prophet, وسلم, and with the rules in tasawwuf and the rest of it, which obviously is a completely different issue and a great area. But one of the rules, <coughs> one of the major rules in tasawwuf is, if, is that the shaykh or the peer or the person who's in the murshid, if he does anything which is against the apps of the sunnah, then he's, it's not permissible to make that person one's shaykh or one's peer or one's murshid, okay? And this <coughs> so this hadith shows that a person will never touch the hand of a, of a female. And another hadith very famous where Aisha Rodiana says the Prophet did not touch the hand of a ghayr mahram ever in his life. A ghayr mahram woman. SubhanAllah. Now, yes, when this bay'ah was done, then some of the youngsters from the from Medina Munawwara said to the Prophet ﷺ that look these are people who have been oppressing you they have been attacking you boycotting you killing your companions and driving you out from your place and etc and now they're all there sleeping why don't we attack them they, they are asleep and we can kill as many as we want now we can kill at least 30 40 before they wake up and they can defend themselves and because they have just come for the pilgrimage no one has got weapons and it would be a massacre it would be a massacre and we could kill a lot of them and this would be good for us and it would be a good preemptive strike. Prophet said, no, 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 this is not my way, this is not what I have been ordered to do, to just kill people in cold blood. And again, this, again, this, just this, just this one line proves to us that all those people who move accusations against Islam and say that the Prophet and Islam are barbaric, then this shows if the Prophet was barbaric and he was all about going and attacking people for no reason, then he would have said, okay, let's do this. But he didn't. So this again proves to us that these people have baseless accusations against Islam. And this sparks because of their hatred for Islam. So Prophet ﷺ said to him, do not fight with this. And I mentioned that the deal was for defensive jihad. The reason why this is important again is because when the Muslims were in Medina to Munawwara, there was a time the Prophet ﷺ was going to fight with the Mushrikeen. And he asked for permission from the from the people in Medina, from the Ansar. Why? Because it was a, the deal was only about defensive jihad, not offensive jihad. But again, the Ansar said, of course, we are with you, offensive or defensive. You are more beloved to us than our own sons, than our own children, our own fathers. And we will defend you till our last breath. So this is, I mean, this was how the um, Muslims made an agreement, the Muslims made an agreement with the people from Medina Munawwara. And that's why the Muslims migrated to Medina Munawwara, inshallah. So hopefully, in this uh, short talk, one hour, inshallah, we just try, try to cover all the, any 
the thing with the seerah is it's not in you won't find in order from one hadith right all the way to the end where a person will narrate the full story of the seerah because look this is just one aspect and I've just taken two two narrations and it's been over an hour and all of that written down would be pages and pages so you won't find this in the hadith book where a person will just sit down and give the whole story like this again because the sahaba they had they were doing a lot of things I mean, there were Sahabu were businessmen and there were people who were working and those who were busy learning the deen and the majority of them in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and defending the deen. So it's hard to find a full, uh, full narration like this. But what we can do is take different narrations from different places, put them together, and inshallah we can keep, paint a little a sketch and we can sketch a little picture and put the seal of the process in the forward like this. So these are the lessons we can learn from from the Medina period, sorry, from the Hijra from the period, the Hijra period, and the lessons from this journey of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the whole purpose, the whole point of studying this seerah, studying anything, a person studies the fiqh of Ramadan or the fiqh of Hajj before he, fiqh of Hajj before he goes for Hajj, fiqh of Ramadan before Ramadan, so that he can he can get the full, the proper experience, and he can do everything correctly in the Ramadan, in the Hajj. Exact same thing here when we study the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to implement the, the the sayings and to implement the stories because if we don't and implement the teachings if we don't implement the hidayat and the advices given by the Prophet ﷺ and the examples from from these incidents in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, then it's kind of, yani, we wouldn't say useless but we have not gained much benefit from sitting in such a talk we've just wasted our time and in reality and to be honest with you you're actually building a case against ourselves if a person was to hear something and he hear all this about the deen and know about all the different things about the Prophet ﷺ and what's allowed and what's not allowed and then he still goes against it then he's just building a case against himself in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to accept everything that has been said we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make these words witness for us and not against on the day of judgment Amin wa akhu ta'awana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa ma alayna illa al-balaq al-mubin